All right, I'm gonna turn off my... All right, let me continue. Okay, for everyone who's watching this now, uh, what Andrea is going to do is she's going to give us a, a walkthrough, kind of an overview of what her UX training is going to be. And then after this, after she gets some feedback, then she's going to go in and actually record everything for real. So we're going to let Andrea take off whenever she's ready. Okay, cool. And definitely Dan and Joanne, you guys can jump in um, at any point. So Dan just has a recall. These are like the ultimate deliverables that I'm going to give. So the UX elements um, in a membership, the membership site models, and then a couple bonuses. Today, specifically, I'm going to probably go deeper on the membership site models, because I think it'll be the thing that people in your course are the most interested in. Okay. Um, this is my theory. So I think first, just a disclaimer, uh, because I think a lot of times if anybody is listening and has any orientation to user experience, um, I didn't want to go into like a whole monologue of like, this is what user experience is. But I do think it's important to know that my bias and where I'm framing a lot of this is based in, you know, I help people build flagship learning journeys. So I, I'm not really involved in e-commerce. Um, many, you know, I don't do e-commerce clients. So I am sure that there are a hundred ways that you could use membership sites for the purpose of e-commerce, but that's definitely not where my expertise is and not where these models come from. Um, just as, as an example. Um, but they are, I do cover the pretty broad range of what a potential learning experience is, which I think is like 90% of why we build membership sites today is for the intention of a learning experience. All right. I'm going to pause there. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. Because yeah. yeah, I certainly don't think of, I don't think of what we're doing in membership sites or anything having to do with e-commerce unless the e-commerce also includes some sort of a, um, what am I thinking here? Um, you know, a digital product, some right. sort of a course to go along with it. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay, perfect. So uh, I'm going to talk about the six models that I discovered after evaluating um, a lot of membership experiences. So pretty much for just out of sheer dumb luck, uh, back in when I started Design Hacking School, my very first client was a membership client. I didn't ask for it. I didn't even know really what I was getting into, but that was my very first design hacking project was a membership site. And I loved it. I was hooked. There was everything about it I loved. And then again, just pure dumb luck wasn't intentional. I continued to get membership projects all along the way. And pretty much every single client that I've ever worked with now is a membership project. Sometimes there'll be a sales funnel and opt-in. A lot of times there are, but there's always a membership project that's associated with it. Um, so I, because I was hooked and I wanted to understand how to do that better. And I, while I love design hacking, as we all know, I don't think that it goes really deep in terms of what can you do with a membership site? So I started to evaluate it. Hey, Rick. So I started to evaluate any membership site and I like spent hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on any membership site that was coming my way. I would buy it and analyze it and swipe it. And so, so far I've analyzed about 60 different types of membership site experiences and they've gone by all different kinds of names. So they've been gone by just memberships. They've gone by digital courses, workshops, mini workshops, online courses, databases, vaults, enterprises, content libraries. I mean, this is just a small sample of the words that people would use to describe these membership sites that they have built. Um, I also didn't just analyze ClickFunnels membership sites. So some of the biggest competitors, as we all know, um, Teachable, Thinkific, Kajabi um, are really popular ones. But then LearnDash in the WordPress world is another one that you'll see regularly, um, especially for learning experiences. Um, I did see one Entreport one, um, but that's pretty rare. Uh, and there's a couple other ones that have been like popping up, but those ones are probably the ones that I, I see the most. And then of course, ClickFunnels, which is my weapon of choice. Um, and largely Dan, because of what you do, it is afforded me the ability to have ClickFunnels as my we weapon of choice. And I will definitely go on record and you can use this as that if people don't have what you are doing, then the ClickFunnels membership does not compete with those other tools. It just simply doesn't. Um, and it's, it, you have to have the stuff I think that you provide in order to make these membership sites an actual learning experience, um, that's of any consequence. 
So, and you can, again, use that all you want. I would stand by that all day long. Um, now, this was a definition that I shared with you guys last time in terms of, you know, sometimes membership sites, when we use that term, it gets confused with the business model. And that's not what I'm talking about. And Stu McLaren is, you know, the one that's responsible, I think, for people thinking about membership sites through a business model, recurring revenue. That's not what I'm talking about. You can have whatever business model you want to any of these learning experiences. And that's a different topic. So when I'm talking about membership site, I'm talking about these virtual spaces that are um, have a, a consist of features and then usually multiple touch points. So a customer is coming back into that virtual space again and again and again and interacting with it in different ways. Um, and just as a note, I know you guys probably know this, but I think the reason why I love these so much is that it's very akin to, um, I spent 18 years developing technology products and the, the way that you go about designing those and building those I think you can carry a lot of those same principles into the membership site experiences because of this multi-touch point frequent use um, aspect of membership sites. And so a lot of what I'm bringing here comes from that 18 years of user experience um, that in when I used to develop SaaS products. Okay, so ta -ta, you guys might've heard me talk about this, but after analyzing all of those 60 plus membership sites and just being involved in a ton of different learning experiences, what I found is that there are six basic models of learning experience. And the reason why this is so important is that I see this as an architectural foundation. Just to put it into reference, again, I'm always interested in building experiences. So. The, what the architecture does is it allows us to say, okay, what is that big intentional experience that we're going for with this model? So to give you an example, if I'm going out and I'm going to build an obstacle course, right? How I structure the obstacle course and how I build it is going to be very different than if I'm going to go out and architect a library. So in the case of the obstacle course, there's usually some time pressure. People are interacting with each obstacle at a time there is usually some kind of concentrated effort and there's a set path from start to finish. Versus a library, if I'm architecting for that, people are gonna come in the door with their own queries. I don't really know what they're gonna come in the door for. They're gonna peruse, they're gonna browse, they're gonna sit. I don't know the path they're gonna go. So I have to architect the space so that it affords for any of these possible scenarios of exploration and discovery. So how I would architect these two things would be very different in order to accomplish the experience that I want to, that I'm intending to deliver. So in the case of these six models, the same is true. So we know that each of these six models has a generic intended experience that we can, that we can use to inform our designing and building. So let me go one level deeper. Actually, let me pause. Any questions so far? Mm, no, I don't think so. Nope. Hey, Rick, in case, in case you didn't know what was going on here, Rick, Andrea is going through her UX stuff. Yes. Yeah. Um, okay. There right. you go. <laughs> okay. So let's go into one as an example. So challenge models. Challenge models, we know um, the very typical experience with challenge models is that there's usually some pressure. Um, it, the whole goal of most of the challenge models that I observed up there were normally at the beginning of the value letter, and it was intended to do like a jumpstart. So it's intended to like start the momentum and jumpstart them into a program or break them free of what they're currently, their current state and shift them into this new state. Um, I define a challenge experience as one or more units of instruction that students go through within a set amount of time. It could be calendar dates, it could be goal-based, um, it could be like stopwatch-based. And there's definitely this push of energy behind completing the challenge in that time frame. That, again, you, you feel the pressure when you're in these challenge situations, and it really is intended for that jumpstart. So if I were to, I'm a big visual person, and sometimes it helps me to picture, okay, what does that actually look like? So what I have in my mind when I'm building challenges are things like a short little sprint race or like that baby first step, but it's like a short distance that I can do or the momentum factor of like, I just got to get you into like, you know, you're here and I need to get you here. Um, or that like just enough leap to make it feel like a big win, right? But it's, it's not a huge journey normally. It's usually a concentrated period of time. 
So as an example, um, I'm going to use your Dan, you know, what you did here. The reason why this is so successful for a challenge model, if we were going to architect this is because, and this is just to name a few, but it keeps the focus on the goal, which is really important in a challenge model. It keeps the pressure on. So it's not just like a, you know, the way that you would put the UX elements in here. It's not just like a general, this is where you're at. This is your progress, but you would use things like how far you are from your goal, right? That is a much different feel again, in order to put that pressure on, keep that pressure on, or it's day seven, like this is like, let's go, you know, very like lots of excitement. And then again, keeping that focus on the goal. And if I were to make my wish list for challenge models is that again, you know, every time they jump in, you have this dynamic feature. That's the reason why challenges are so successful. And then it jumps me right into the state that I'm in at that particular point in the ch ch challenge to keep me on track. One of the, I'll pause there. Any questions on that one? And I think there's a lot more that this one does, Dan, that I could probably pull out of why this may, this becomes a successful uh, model for a challenge experience. Well, one thing I notice as I'm looking at it here, I see there it says um, it's day seven of your challenge. What I should have in there, it should be it's day seven of your 30 day challenge. Yes, exactly. Yes. And then yep. I don't know if I built it into this one or not, but the slider bar, I need to have that calibrated. So if it's seven of 30 days that it's only over whatever percent seven is into 30, you know, whatever, 20. Exactly. Percent. Yeah. Exactly. And then when we get to it, so the U this is what I would call a UX element. And so um, a lot of times you want to think when you're interacting with UX element, how much attention am I going to demand from the end customer? And in the case of a challenge, I want this to be high demand. So in this case, and I wouldn't recommend this in a lot of cases, but in the challenge case, I might even do some kind of animation on that progress bar in order to demand a little bit more attention than just what the color contrast is doing right now. So on page load, just have a start at zero and move over. Yeah, something like okay. that, or even no, like a little yeah. like pulse or a little line that kind of quivers or yes, exactly. And well, there is there is the one built in function in ClickFunnels where it's got the the moving lines. Oh, okay. I don't know. Um, in, in the... Uh, what the heck is the progress bar element? Yeah. Oh, right. one of, oh, one, the of this, one of the settings yes. is, yeah, it, it so kind of, it animates yes. it that way too. But I could have a yeah. slide in from the left-hand side out as far as you have progressed. That is so smart. And it's smart on a couple levels. One, it demands my attention. And two, again, when these challenges, I want to feel like I'm getting a quick win. So just by that line moving, instead of just static, I actually get a little bit of like a positive reinforcer of like, I've made this progress. So it's a, it's a really, it's a really good technique for challenge. Models. Well, and a note that I wrote down already here for myself, for my stuff is that, I mean, the upshot of it is, is basically whenever new content is being put out. So in a challenge like this every day, that person gets an email that forces them to be pulled back into the system. You could even do bots, you could do uh, text messages, yes. you could be whatever to pull them back in. So if you drop content yeah. once a week, you better be giving them an email every week to pull them back in because A, otherwise, because I was thinking as you were talking about, I was like, how many courses have I never finished because I basically forgot about them. But if yes. I'm getting a, a weekly email to remind me for over six months, um, it's going to remind me to come back in and do that. Or especially if you got somebody who's in a monthly membership, you got to be hitting them every time content is getting out there and, and even future pacing them. Hey, uh, you know, next month we're going to get X, Y, and Z um, so that they stay in. So they pay the extra the next month. Yes, exactly. And what you're getting at, which is, is I wasn't quite sure how to incorporate that. So what I, I think that all successful learning journeys have to have three components. They have to have the membership hub is what I call it, which is essentially the membership site. They have to have a nurture path, which is what you're talking about, email, text, um, automations in order to drive them back into the hub. And they have to have a community. So Facebook group, Binding Network, Circle.io. Those three components, and it doesn't matter what model you're using, those three components are critical in order to have a really effective learning experience. Okay. Now, 
what's interesting is that in each of these six models, there's, there's usually one of those components that needs more attention when you're designing and building than the other three. Well, so now they, let's just stop yeah. here for a second. So in your course content here, uh, make sure you, you touch on all three of those aspects early on and with each one of these models. Okay. Well, so this is what I wanted to ask. So I have this when I talk about like the business of building a membership site. So typically, especially design hackers that are coming in, I think they only think about the membership site aspect. But again, when you're making the shift to a learning journey or a learning experience, you have to have these other two. And then of course, there's the business strategy part, which is usually the, the pricing model. But um, I didn't really talk a lot about the community and the nurture but what I do think is super relevant for when we're building membership sites and in your core stand is you have to understand the integrations and what's possible in the integrations in order to connect these three dots. And so I can mm. definitely have a section about that. Well, I mean, I would, I would touch on it up front, And then like, okay. so when you get to the challenge part, you say, okay, now in order to have the nurture path here, what you would want to do is make sure because you're every day. So let's just pretend we're doing a 30 day challenge here. Um, every day, you want to be able to touch these people, you want to send them an email, you want to send them uh, SMS, whatever you want to be in the group saying, okay, hey, everybody, make sure you get over to the membership today, because we're talking about X, Y, and Z. Okay, cool. I'm just going to make a little note. Yeah. Um, to talk about the other two factors of the learning journey. Okay. Okay, cool. I can definitely add that here. Well, and you'll have this video too to go reference. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So, and these are just a couple things that I pointed out. What I would love to do is even if like other people have great challenge examples that they wanna put forward, I think we could actually have a library of what are some of those great challenge models and why are they successful? Because I think unfortunately a lot of times and especially because I think of this one, so Russell's flagship offer, we know this is the thing that allows people to probably have the highest level of conversion and stay the longest with ClickFunnels. That's not me making it up. That's Russell sharing that yeah, straight yeah. from his mouth, right? No, they, I that, think they've gotten more people in with um, OFA yes. than anything else. Yes, yes. Now, I really don't like what they did in the last one, but we can talk about that. This is the, what you're looking at here is what they have been doing all the way up until the very last um, iteration of OFA. But essentially, this is a challenge model and it hits all the criteria. When you come in this, there's a lot of momentum. Um, it is like you're going to have 30 days to accomplish this set thing to get you into ClickFunnels, to basically funnelize your business and get you up and running with the ClickFunnels platform. Um, that in it, you feel the pressure every single way. I mean, they even took the Mission Impossible soundtrack to yeah. promote this feeling of like, dun, 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 right? Like we're in, like we're, it's on. What's so fascinating to me is that this membership site actually doesn't really support what a true challenge model experience is. Right. I think where they make it up is through the Facebook group, the coaching, the nurture path, right? So nurture path and community is actually, I think what promotes the experience that they're intending here and really great music. <laughs> um, well, and the other thing you have to remember, it was also Steve going live every day and yelling at you. Yes, exactly. And people there, people became addicted to getting yelled at him every day. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I don't, I don't see a lot of people doing that for 30 days straight like he did. Right. I mean, like three or four or five times in a row. Yes, exactly. Yes. And you have a coach that's right there. The only thing I would say that they did well in the OFA challenge, just from a pure learning, learning journey, like supporting the challenge model is they did do a drip. So they only released one thing at a time. So if you think back to the obstacle course, which is really akin to the challenge, I need you to focus on one thing at a time, accomplish that one thing, then go on to the next. That's very akin to challenge models. And that's what they did. You only had one day at a time that you could open and then it didn't open until 24 hours later, the next one. Yeah, but their, their site though, although it is a drip, the, actually, 
I'm sure the first time it was a drip because Steve was doing it all live at that point. And, uh, but after that, I don't know if it was or not because people could come back to visit this. Of course, the first time they did it, they did it on tiny networks or whatever the heck. It Mighty was. networks. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, what they do, Dan, is so once you're an alumni, um, that's why if you go into the One Following Challenge, you'll see this alumni section um, okay. right here. So once you've gone through it, everything that you went through will show up here. But if you go into the main challenge, it will all go away again. Okay. So they drip that out again. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they set a different tag or purchase yes. or something for all of us. Yeah. Okay. And you don't, I, have, see I haven't been section. in there for so long. I, I forget what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing I think that they do in order to promote challenge model, which is really effective is they have an, a, an open close, right? So like everybody come in, we're starting on the same date. We're ending on the same date. There's a lot of momentum when you go into what I call the cohort model, right? right. Everybody's coming in together. Everybody's ending together and then door shut. Okay. Everybody come in together. We're going to end together door shut. So that also creates a lot of pressure, a uh, pressure cooker for these challenge models, which is really good. Well, what do you think of the guys doing the five day challenges on Facebook? Um, I think it's shit. Um, I, and the reason is just because at least this, I could visually come in and see when the next section was open. Like I, you know, I could, I could see what my next one was. I knew where I needed to be. When you go into Facebook, those guides are horrible. <laughs> like, no, no, I'm, I'm not talking the guides. Like I'm just thinking in particular, uh, Doug Bowden did a five day challenge, uh, couple of weeks back yeah. and so on monday he got on for an hour and did some coaching mm. teaching whatever and then said okay everybody's got an assignment put your assignment into the uh into the member or into the into the facebook yeah and tuesday repeat etc cetera, etc cetera. now he actually had a really good idea where he created teams yeah and he had all the teams competing against each other for points yep it's with so prizes smart, at the right? end right yeah, yeah no, so that, I've never seen anybody do that before, especially not on Facebook. But how could you incorporate a membership site like this along with a five day challenge or something on Facebook? Um, I don't know that like the experience of Facebook, like what you can actually do is so limited, right? I mean, everything you're describing has really nothing to do with with what Facebook enables. It's just what he set up as the system of the challenge. Well, what I'm thinking is, so build a five-day challenge where there's some sort of content inside of a ClickFunnels membership oh, area. Oh, right. Yes. And then the question becomes is even, can you stream your feed in there? I know if you're doing it on YouTube, you can stream your feed into the Facebook, I mean, into the ClickFunnels um, membership area. Yeah. But you'd have to get everybody from Facebook to log in, sign up and get into your membership area, right. which that may, you may have too much fallout doing that too. Yeah. And I think that that is why the OFA is playing around with how do we, there is, so first of all, that's really important is that there is right now, there is no one system that actually effectively accomplishes all three of those things in one system. You know, there's nothing that has a nurture path, a, a community and a content hub that does that really well. I know that each, there's a couple of people, like some people would say Kajabi could do it, right? But it's, they're not great at community. You know what I mean? It's just a- Well, and there'd be plenty of people thing. tell you WordPress would be perfect for it as well. Sure. Um, but like Slack or anything else, the problem is people aren't hanging out there. People right. are hanging out on Facebook. Exactly. And, and I am of the opinion that I think where software products in particular go wrong is when they try to do too much for too many people. Like that's when they lose their, they lose their, their thing, you know, the thing that makes them really good. I mean, if you think about it, like developing a really good online community tool, like there's no end to what we can do there. But then if you're spreading your resources to then also do a content hub, which is an eternity of work, and then also do a nurture path, which is an etern I mean, it just doesn't make sense because then you're starting to compete against like active campaign, you know what I mean? And it just, it doesn't make sense. I mean, it's the same reason why I think click funnels should just abandon backpack and follow up funnels, but that's my two cents. <clears throat> that's blasphemy. I love follow up funnels. I know you do. I know uh, you do. Know. They're <laughs> perfect. They're right there. They're right there in front of me. I'd see here again. Right. I don't have to go anywhere else. Right. I don't have to build zaps to send the stuff over there. 
I never have to do that. I use right Active there. Campaign. It's an API integration, which okay. I think you're bringing up a good point though, Dan. And that is, I was having this really interesting conversation with this community of practice around communities. And I think the winners in these spaces are actually going to be the one that has a little bit more open API. So like, I think like Circle.io is a community that I think you could embed inside a ClickFunnels membership area, right? So it's like these integrations and open APIs that I think is where it gets more exciting. Um, in, instead of what a platform trying to do all things, but yeah, I don't know. Again, for the community aspect, I think that as long as you have Facebook people, yeah. cause people are in Facebook and that little thing pops up and it says, Oh, yeah. Hey, somebody just uh, asked a question over in the group you belong to and you rush over there to get it. It's your, you know, yeah. you're just the rat ringing the bell to get more cocaine. Yeah. In this group that I, analogy. Yeah, no, no, no. I think so in this group that we were having community practice, uh, one of the experts on there raised the point and I have adopted it since then. And I, a hundred percent believe this to be true for my clients that I've seen until you have an offer that is like 5k or more, the cost of switching from a Facebook group as your community tool is not worth it. The juice is not worth the squeeze until you get into these higher price point programs where people are investing more. So their likelihood of going to the special place where they invested a lot of money is higher. It's possible, but until you're in that like 5k, 10k range, I don't think that the cost of switching is worth it. People are on Facebook. It's well, and I think part of it is, so let's say you're teaching um, stock market, something or another, and you also give them, the charting software and everything else. Well then, yeah, they're definitely leaving Facebook to come over and do your thing. Exactly. And so there it makes sense to have the community built in right there because you're doing your thing with your charts and you go, how do I blah, blah, blah. Yes. And you just ask the question right there. Exactly. Yeah. But, but you're right. What we're doing um, at this level is, is definitely not that. Yeah. Yep. I would. So hundred percent of my clients use Facebook groups as the community platform. Um, again, because we have so many other things to tackle to make a really great learning experience. The choice of community and management of that community tool, like that can be a later decision. That can be a later change. <laughs> Facebook groups is good enough. Okay. Let's get moving on. And we're going to okay. run this until midnight. Yeah. Okay. So the next one is course models. So I'm just going to go into two just to, and then I'd love like feedback in terms of like, is this helpful? What else would you go? So, and again, we're just at the architecture level right now, and I'm going to bring this down all the way to like the UX elements. So um, the course model, the, the biggest difference between a course model and a challenge model is the pressure is off. So this one is, there's one or more units of instruction. Normally there's some sort of test um, or certification. And the most important part about course models is you're gonna go a little bit deeper and there is a rites of passage. So um, there's a, and again, the one that we all know the most is design, uh, design, design school. Um, sorry, the image that I usually have with course models, unfortunately, a lot of us, because of how we've all been educated, fall into these traditional models of what I call the info vomit model. Here's a, here's a video, go do the thing, or here's a video, here's some information, but it doesn't actually have more, what I would prefer with great learning experiences is what I would call an apprenticeship model, where I'm going to teach you a little bit, go do, and then I'm going to hold you accountable for what that is. So it's that critical feedback loop, which is also really important for adults. Um, I mean, it's important for kids too, but adults especially. So it's like, if I'm actually going to get any kind of mastery in this course, I need to have that feedback loop, which apprenticeship models just work so much better than our traditional education models. So, so, one so hang on here. So yeah. you're saying with this course model here, you have to have some sort of a level of achievement to move forward. I would recommend it. So what I typically do with my clients is, and I'll, I'll get to this in the next section of like, how do you decide how you hold people accountable? So it could be like a person saying good, bad, right, wrong, you know, go, no, go, or it could be a system, which typically in a system level, it's like quizzes is what we're used to. But let me show you a really good example. That is a system level feedbacks that we, that there's no person involved. So in CF design school, the very first challenge that we have to do is she gives us high structure. She gives us go design hack this website, right? And then we have to go and design hack it. 
So the feedback loop is a system-based feedback loop because I literally am looking at the thing she gave me I have to look like, and I'm comparing the thing I did to see if it looks like it. That's a feedback loop. It's brilliant. It's really good for tactical skills, right? So anything that we can do to insert a feedback loop to hold accountability, it could be a quiz, but that typically is not like deep learning. Um, or if we could give them an example, like in your case, Dan, it would be like, here's a membership site, go build it and literally look and then do a function test, right? So here's the first challenge, go build this, don't pass go, don't collect $200 until you've got that one done. And it has to function and look, et cetera, just like this one does, um, would be an example of that feedback loop. Rick, did I lose you? <laughs> no, I just turned off his screen. That's all. I know. He's out. He's yeah. done. <laughs> he, he just he just had his dinner delivered, so he doesn't want us nice. to watch him eat it. All good. All good. Bon appetit. He's late there in Washington. Yep. Bon appetit. Um, the other thing that I'll point out in Design Hacking School, which she did so well, is in a course model, um, it typically does have a rites of passage. So everybody loves the badges, right? And we, I think, falsely think that people love the badges because of like points and all this stuff. But the reason why those badges are so good is that they're connected to these critical rites of passage, right? I did my first design hacking thing. I earned my first 10K. You know, they're, they're really meaningful. They're connected to something that's really deep and meaningful for the purpose of why I'm learning design hacking. And I think that is really why people love the badges so much in design hacking school. It's not for what we typically associated to in these like superficial competitive, I got a point and I'm winning. I don't think that's really why people love it to the degree that they love it. Um, okay, so I'm okay, gonna- Okay, so, so hang on here yeah. a second. So because, because I want you to, as you're doing this training to really pull out the important points. And obviously that one was- very important point that here in your just your basically your mundane course model that we've all seen 20 bajillion times Catherine put in just a couple little tiny tweaks yes that made such a massive difference to everyone and the badges which causes the rite of passage yes um and people can say oh hey you know i'm i'm a number six i'm an eight i got the 50k award yes. you know whatever um yes so make sure again, you really pull those bits out as you're going along here, as I like to say, a magic trick. So what is the magic trick for each one of these? So, yes. so then on the challenge, which we've already gone through, what is the magic trick there? Um, what the is the real key point that, that would cause people to use and or love that model, especially as the consumer? Yeah, it's the quick win. It's the quick win is with the challenge model. So it's not that I got like 10 badges, but it's that I was able to make this first step and do it successfully, whatever that first step is. So, so lots of little, lots of little tiny steps every day, tiny. essentially. Yes. Yep. It could be okay. every day or it could be at the end of the challenge, but I would, I think every day is better in the challenge model. Cause remember again, like, well, and here, here's when you're, cause you've said this a couple of times, you said, well, I think this is better. I want you to come from the point of the authority and say, do it this way because this is the best way to do it. I can say I highly recommend it. it, but the <laughs> the challenge with experience is that it's not, it, there's more art. Oh, I mean, there's art and craft to it, right? Okay, so, I get it. But, but, you know. It's true, but people, you also gave people, your disclaimer at the beginning. So you're yeah, good. Yeah, there you, you can go. say, okay. I think this is the way you should do it. Mm. Okay, all right. <laughs> I highly yeah. recommended that this way. Well, and to pull it back to the visual of it, it's like the challenge model is like that kid first learning to walk, right? Like any success that that kid has, even if it's like a baby step and they fall, right? It's really important that they make that baby step. That, that is the magic of challenges is that, and that's why the OFA is so good is that I got a ton of wins in that program every day. And it hooked me. And I think if you listen to the interviews that Steve did and you listen to people's account of OFA, they rave about it. There's a lot of factors, but the, I think the biggest contributing factor is that they made progress in their business as an entrepreneur every single day during the challenge. Well, and the best analogy for the stories you're telling there is the simple story is like, have you ever seen a baby who tried to get up and walk and fell on his butt who didn't try to get back up again? Exactly. Exactly. Because if so, there'd be a lot of kids, you know, 
<laughs> the wheelchair never business learned is how to walk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yep. Yes. Yes. And I think you actually, there's something really important actually underneath what you just said, Dan. And that is the kid doesn't ask, why am I walking? Right. It's, it's an innate desire to want to walk. Right. And I think in really great challenges, it's this, I have an innate desire to want to be an entrepreneur in the case of OFA. And you are allowing me to make those steps in that innate desire. Right. And I'm seeing the progress of it. Okay. All right. Yeah. Just, you know, I mean, those are all, again, the key points here of why would you use this model over something else? And, you know, that's what is part of it. I love that you went there. Okay. So if we think about, I'm building a pyramid here, right? And I think about the model. We've stayed like, it's uh, models are still fairly abstract. Okay, I'm hang on a second. How did we go from the course model to now this diagram? Um, I don't so, me on that. Yes. I know we, I know we talked about something else, but how did we go from one to the next year? Yeah. So if there's six basic membership site models, right? Okay. And if we think about these models, they are the first base understanding of designing and building great learning experiences is I got to have the architecture. I got to kind of know what am I building? What's the, what's the general intention of what okay. I'm building? We have to know whether we're building a building or we're digging a canal. Exactly. Am I building that library or that obstacle course? Yes, okay. exactly. And so these six models are your choices. Like okay. pick one of these models based on the intention of the experience. Okay. The next layer down, and I'll come here. The next layer down is what I call the experience factors. So what you asked is like, well, how do I make the decision of what I'm building and like what goes into it, right? I've asked the intention questions, but now we're getting into a little bit more of like the detail of it. So how do I, you know, what do I do inside of that experience? And what I call these are the experience, the key experience factors. And again, that this wasn't planned, but after studying all of those membership sites and looking at what are the key experience factors in each one of those. So this is just a, a list of like, as I was doing my research, the things that I saw as the key experience factors, it boils down into six, didn't, wasn't intentional, six different key experience factors that go into how do I actually build the great experience in each one of these models. So they are the content strategy. So when I'm trying to design a great learning experience, what is the content strategy? And then the next one is learning pace, the leader coach involvement, community involvement, learning path, and investment. And what I found was that each one of the models matches to the key experience factors. So like, for instance, in the case of a challenge model, um, a lot of times you will see, I'll just use content strategy as an example. So you have, again, these three different ones, you have access control. So it's dripped based on time past, right? So a certain amount of time passed. And so now the content's going to be available to you. In the case of OFA, 24 hours have passed. Next lesson is going to be available to you. Okay. The second option is that it's based on you on a, a specific, I'm sorry, OFA actually uses a specific date because they all come in together. Um, okay. Your course uses the time past, right? So there's a certain amount of time passed and now it's available to you. Um, OFA uses a specific date. Summits use a specific date. So you have 24 hours to access it and then it's going to go away, right? And the next- so basically you're really talking the difference really between a cohort model where everybody starts at the same time versus somebody who just never green product where you're buying it. Anybody can buy and get in at any yes. time and is dripped based upon the date of joining. Yes, exactly. Yep. And then the right. other, and then obviously the next one is open access. So freedom uh, design hacking or design school has open access. And what we found is that, or what I found was that for instance, course models do really well with open access. Challenge models do really well. If a cohort model, you're going to do the date based, or if it's a, so, you know, a solo challenge, which very few are actually, then it's a time passed. And so there's key elements that are or key factors, sorry, that are critical that support each model. Yeah, I, I can't think of a single challenge really that self-pay that you just start right. whenever. 
Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Which this has really big ramifications, Dan. Like this is probably this, this factor is probably one of the biggest things I have with most of my clients, because if you decide to do a cohort model, what you're doing is your marketing strategy, right? You have to have these like parallel tracks of marketing strategy because the doors open and close at key points. So it's like, you always are kind of in these like launch sequences, right? And when, and that is um, the way that you build a ClickFunnels membership site, right? You can't have, as you found out in your course too, right? You can't have both a, a specific date and a drip model at the same time. Yeah, because it's always gonna go off of the date that they signed up. Exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. So um, going back into my, my idea in this is that you have this blueprint basically that when you're working with a client and you're designing a membership site, you have a blueprint for, okay, I know we're building a course model. And so therefore on this key factor, uh, open access is the best path to go. Okay. So when you're going to be doing the training on this, are you going to, cause obviously I, I'm pretty sure we jumped around here a little bit. Yeah. Were you going to go through like all six courses in a row and then, um, so then put like your key, your six key, um, experience factors with each one. So you I say, okay, so here we got that. the challenge. Well, yeah, yeah I, I think the best thing to do would be to go through and say, okay, I, I looked at these 60, 60 different things. These are the, you know, like two or three slides of these were the key things that I took away from it. And so now I'm going to show you the six models that I came up with and show you how they are, how each one of these factors is applied. So here we have a challenge model and on a challenge model, when it comes to content strategy, you know, like have, um, you know, like the access control drip based on specific, have that entire column be yellow. Perfect. And so okay. when you get there, so we're talking about the challenge model, you go six key factors, content strategy, boom, here is the most effective way that I've seen this done. If you don't want to be any more uh, definitive than that, um, just okay. say, okay, this is, this is how we normally see it. And boom, 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 give specific examples of how it works. Okay. Yeah. Per that's perfect. Actually. Cause I have a bunch for each one of them. This is one example of this is Jamie's podcast profit lab, um, which is a course model. And so I basically went through, um, at the time that I was doing this research, I didn't have my sixth factor. The sixth factor actually emerged a little bit later. Um, okay. and I went back, but this is an example of, so in his challenge model or in his course model, this is his, this is how he has structured it along each one of these very, uh, each one of these, um, factors. And okay. then I can show an example. I think, um, let me ask you this question. Cause this is one that I wasn't quite sure of. So big picture. Well, okay. Just hang on before you say that. So you yeah. could have like that, that image you just had on the screen. Mm -hmm. And then, because at this point here, it just says open access, but we don't necessarily know what open access means. So then you can show the next slide here with the yellow in the third column and then say, okay, um, that, so I'm sorry, I interrupted you and you were going to ask what? No, no, no. That's, that's good feedback. Thank you. Um, cause the one question I had as I'm presenting this is, um, so the way my brain works is I go like big picture and then one more level down and then the tactical, right. But I know that go waiting on that tactical is hard sometimes for people to learn. So where I'm going big picture is that I basically have the six models, the six factors, and then I have a whole slew of UX elements that you can plug into each one to enhance the journey. And I've made connections of the paths, just like you just said. So if you have a challenge model, these are the key factors and how you decide on those factors. And these are the key UX elements for that. Yeah, see, I don't know. You kind of lost me in there somewhere, but um, the way I would explain the whole thing is I would start from the 30,000 foot view and go, okay, so I, I went through all these 60 things and here are some of the biggest takeaways I have and then, you know, just spell them all out in general and, and just go through them really quickly and just say, hey, I'm just going to go through these really quickly. And then I'm going to show you how these apply to the six different models I have and which one is most effective for each one of those models. And then you go into challenge model and you go into your first thing and you say, okay, in the challenge model, blah, 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 like we were talking about the columns and stuff. Mm -hmm. okay. And so at the end, you've broken down each one. And then as you break down the challenge funnel, then show 
your examples of those challenge funnels and okay. then move on. And by the time you get to your model number six, you're done. Okay. But the thing, the one thing that I was trying to make the cut, because I think when we start talking about UX elements, that's to me where the um, rubber meets the road in what we're learning in your course. So, okay, but hang on here. Maybe I don't, what, what is a UX element? Maybe so a UX element that. example is when we were looking at your, um, uh, back here, right so here, challenge. this little progress bar is what I call a UX element. Yeah, okay. It's, it's the, it's the components of an experience. Yeah, so I like, would, I would, as you get to that level, so you're, you start at the higher level, you come down, you start talking about the challenge models, what's in each one, what's the most important thing, what's the most normal for each one, then show a picture like this, talk about the UX elements. So I basically, I think what it is, is you turn your pyramid upside down because you're talking about the UX elements last because that's the smallest item on the screen, essentially. Right. That exactly. is the, it may be the most impactful item, uh, but at least from a visual standpoint, but it's really kind of the least important. The exactly. more important is how do you bring people in? How do you drip out the content? How do you get them to pay that kind of stuff, which exactly. is like, you know, basically your second level. Yeah, exactly. And if I'm in, <clears throat> if I choose that I'm in a reference library model, I would never do a progress bar. That would be the worst possible UX right. element you could find, right? right. But I'm going to put a lot of emphasis on the search UX element because that's the most critical element in a in a reference library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But again, I again I I see the UX as being the very bottom thing as you're looking at the site and you say, okay, on a on whatever you said reference library type, you know, on the actual page elements, you probably want this, 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 and this. Yes. Perfect. Okay. okay. But again, I see that as a pyramid coming downward. Um, the visualization is irrelevant to me, but that's the way I would, that's the way I would teach it. Okay. So if I, just to summarize, to make sure I'm hearing you right. So um, it would be, I'm going to introduce the concept of the six models, but then I'm going to go deep on one model to the factors and the elements. And then I'm going to come back up to the model, pick the next model, and then go deep on factors and elements. Yeah. So the first, first, very first thing is, is what was your discovery? How did you get your discovery? First off, I give a little background on yourself, of course. Then what was your discovery, which was going through 60 different ones. You found a whole bunch of unexpected things. These are the three categories of the main things that you found. Now we're going to talk about the six different models and how these three things fit into those six different models. And then at the very bottom, which I guess would be your factors there. And at the very bottom, then you show the, um, for each one of the models, you show an example and you just say, okay, and you really need to have these three things. Yeah. These three elements. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. okay. And then there's, there's the, the last bit of it is the universal elements. So I, I, especially the navigation is a universal element that you're going to have in every single one of the models, but the, the sub parts of that navigation and the way the navigation interacts with all the rest of the content, there's best practices depending on which model you're in. Yeah. So again, that's part of the elements and, uh, but, and, and in every one, it's going to look different. Yes. Yes. I hope so. In order to, you know, promote the best you know, it, to promote the intended experience of that model. Well, I mean, one of them may be like you showed with uh, Russell's site where you got 250 lessons on the left-hand side, whereas the next one might be a bar at the top with five, five elements in it. Exactly. Yeah. Or the challenge, the challenge is even different. The challenge could be so simple that there's no navigation at all. Right. On day seven, boom, this hits your page. That's all you got. Exactly. You, uh, you click on a link to watch the lesson over here in the bottom right hand corner you got a place that you put in your your weight and your uh your blood pressure and what you had to eat last night and you're done exactly actually there's um the cash flow tactics guy um they it's not a membership site i think they're missing an opportunity for like continuity with this but their version of their content hub was actually just an opt-in page that was that day here's what you got to do um, and every day that was delivered both in a text message and in email. 
So it was super, I mean, it was, it was genius for what a challenge, you know, to keep the focus on that day. Um, well, yeah. Started. Then again, at the element level, then again, um, or beyond the element level, that's when you talk about, okay. And how do you, how do you make sure you get people coming back in every day? Um, yes. your communication with them, how do you deal with the community every day yes. as well? Exactly. Yep, exactly. Um, and I think I have my screenshots elsewhere, so I don't want to spend time right now finding it, but yes, they, they did a great job where I thought it was a lost opportunity is that if they would have put that into a membership site, then people could have come, you know, come back to it for that continuity piece. Um, now, everything we've been talking about so far, how long, I mean, is this all going to be one lesson? Because if so, this is going to be a two hour long lesson. No, I don't think it should be. So how I'm thinking about it, Dan, is I have one lesson. That's a shorter lesson. Just talking about the six models that the six models exist. These are the six models. And um, what I did, for instance, up here where I'm, I'm talking about, like, think of this when you think about a challenge model. And then here are the I don't even know that I'd go here, but just like it's a higher level about the six models. You're saying this is all in the first lesson. Yeah. Because I'll yeah. tell you what I what I would envision on something like this is you come in, who are you? 60 things you went through. These are your discoveries. These are your six models. And over the next six weeks, we're going to go through what each and every one of those models is, a big deep dive yeah. on each one. Yes. And then do a deep dive on each model the following six weeks. So you got seven weeks total. Yeah. And then now, even and if you want something bonus beyond the end of it, that's that's fine too even better that I'd love to do is that exact model. But then at the end of it, it's, you've just learned about the challenge model. Go to Dan's lesson four and build your first challenge model, a basic challenge model with these key UX ingredients. Well, yeah. Once I see what all your models are, um, I know I've already got some of them built out. Yes. And I think some of them are also just basic click funnels. They are. And then I, of course, I have my wish list for, <laughs> which I know right. you could do, but it's a, I have my, my UX element wish list on some of this stuff. Okay. All yeah. right. I mean, it's always good, good to build more stuff in. Yes. Perfect. Okay. So we haven't built much yet. Come on. <laughs> What'd you just say? I haven't what? I said, we haven't built much yet. Oh, I know. I know. Yeah, um, I know. Uh, Yes, I'm, I am, uh, yes, that corner, that corner is turning this weekend because yes, I am. No, I don't know. I don't, I'm not, I'm not banging on you. What I'm saying is I was being facetious as in we haven't built much yet. Oh, uh, we, I think uh, we've yeah. built like four or five of the biggest membership site things that I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. All right. So what else you got? So okay. we got, we got that figured out. So basically yes. we, we know what the first seven weeks are essentially going to be. Yes. Yep. And, and, so and again, bring it, bring it down to as basic a level as you can. I mean, and like I said, what are the, what are the key points they got to know? What are the rabbit tricks? What are the things they're going to give and cause the greatest results with the consumers? Yeah. Well, and I think that the, I think where the, the biggest rub is though, is that like, I can, I can tell them about the model and the key UX elements, but I think that the really where it comes in and true good learning experience is them to go and build it, like go do it. Right? Well, yeah. So again, once I see what you got, then, um, so like, you know, so you got your challenge element, um, uh, or model, well, that's a good place then for me to introduce the challenge funnel or challenge membership that I built. Yeah. And okay. This is how it works. This is what you got to do. Blah, blah, blah. Here's, here's the template. Um, go and build it. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, okay. So that is, now, this... now I got one other question here. Is there a specific reason that or specific, I'm drawing the blank here and everything today. Um, is there a reason for the order of your six models? Yes, there is. Um, it's the most, from the most popular that I've seen to the least popular. Um, okay. And I think that the reason- Because for... the way I would want to build them would be the easiest to the hardest. Okay. So could we switch the order easy to hard? Yeah. Because like, like I don't think any of them are going to get into- you know, dashboards or hubs or anything like that. Right. Um, so probably the highest level one actually is the challenge. Um, maybe, I think it depends, like if you add the progress tracker to a course, right? That's where it gets more complicated. 
well, is that something that you're going to put in there? I would rec- Yeah. So one of the key UX elements is some form of, um, major milestone accomplishment. Is that rites of passage? Okay. All know? right. Yeah. I guess we already had that down for course, didn't we? So. But I think for rites of passage, Dan, there's, you know, I think showing badges is really uh, an advanced skill set, right? You could still do some really simple UX elements that accomplish a sense of rites of passage when you're first getting started. And so I can maybe place it in terms of like advancement level of, you know, when you're first getting started, just start with this first thing, like a simple Google form integration, like what we did with the 10 steps program. If you remember Mm -hmm. that, right? Like that is a very simple rites of passage element that you could put in that makes a big difference on the experience. Okay. Well, yeah. So yeah, give a list then of what are the things you could do um, for your customer. And then we can, whether it's one video or three, um, we could build them all in. Yeah. Okay. That sounds good. Okay. Yeah. Cause that's just like a simple Google sheet embed, right? It's super simple. Yeah. Right to passage. So, yeah, um, or woofoo form or anything else. I've got like already three or four videos <laughs> in sea of ninja hacks for that. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, perfect. Um, the other thing that I think the other model that I think is also a really easy build is a summit model. Um, if you don't go crazy, like what I did with the global dance summit, but most, most of the builds are for summits. You don't want them really hard because they're usually at the bottom of the value ladder. It's usually people who are just starting the purpose of the summits. If you follow Russell's models for lead gen and it's free. So you're, you don't want to invest a lot of time in these summit models. And so you want quick, easy wins on the experience front without big, heavy builds. All right. Well, again, if you give me some examples of some easy ones. Okay. Because I suppose like even like his lead, his lead funnel challenge, that essentially was a summit. Yeah. I, to be honest with you, I don't even remember what he built that on. I, I assume it was in ClickFunnels. Yeah. And it was probably, probably like with... a PLF kind of format. Yeah. And we don't even have to go as far as they do with their summits. Like, let me show you an example of like, I'm running a summit right now. Again, he's a brand new entrepreneur. He's just getting started. Um he it's it it needs to be simple and affordable for him um so this is like they're dead simple almost out of the box stuff with click funnels. well yeah we were working on this yesterday did you get that vip yeah. thing fixed um yeah it looks really good the only thing i don't have fixed is that stupid menu <laughs> so yeah looks really good there's a little bit of a thing right there but when oh, i know then I, you didn't read my message just i did remember, but when remember I, how we set the width i did but then when i started playing with it it messed up this one like they weren't consistent. So I basically went to the path of least resistance across all of them. Oh, well here on this one here, you don't have any black above there. So the section or the, the row above there needs a black background for the, because otherwise that's sticking up. Plus you need some more padding at the that top. That one doesn't have it though either. That's what I mean. The... Uh, I think it's basically you built the sections or the rows differently is what the issue is because mm-hmm. they should all work and you should just be able to increase the width of that text element we and can, then, I'll, then I'll bring the border out further. We can take a look at it. I mean, I literally just copy and pasted each one, but yeah, I'd love to take a look at it. Okay. Yeah. But yeah so right. this is when an we're, example, though, when we're like, done here. Yeah. This is an example of like a summit model. That's super easy. Right. And I don't even need to have this menu, which isn't working right now. But I mean, it's just really simple, basic UX elements, right? Like it doesn't have to be complicated. Again, where the entrepreneur is at when they're doing a summit, you don't need that level of sophistication, but it's just super dead simple. Um, You know, and you can add little tiny things like active color and collapse and, you know, my six basic things that go in all models that are good with any nav element, but yeah, just super, super simple in terms of a build. Um, yeah, so that was the, this is day one mind. Um, and then also just like, you know, the, the UX element of a deep link is a really important in a summit because they might know it by the speaker. They might know it by the topic. They might know it by the day. And so you have to have these deep links is the way that you navigate the different ways that people might come into the summit and what they're looking for. Is your brain going off, Dan? You got the big paper. <laughs> uh, no, I was just, I was making a list earlier of the stuff we were talking about the other day 
for the membership light. Oh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And your, um, you know, your use of the, uh, um, the JavaScript to do deep linking, right? Again, really important UX element in summits. Well, yeah, you're talking the internal linking. Yes, the internal. Not the outside. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. When you when I say deep link, you think outside, right? No, no not necessarily. I knew, knew what you were oh. talking about. Okay. Jamie, when Jamie says deep link, he means outside. But yeah. Well, what does he what does he call the internal linking? Um. Does he? Yeah, he's got a plug in. Member for that, link. He? Member link. I think. Okay, it doesn't matter. All right, yeah. keep going here. Let's yeah. just let's finish up the okay. UX stuff in case well, somebody's actually watching this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So um, all right. So what we just went through was the six models, right? And so then you'll have again, like we can have the six just like we talked about. So the one overview and then six different um where we go deep into each one of the models, the key UX ingredient or elements, and then go build. Um, then these ones are just kind of I, I think that um for this one. This is where I started to go. You had mentioned the cookbook. And what's so funny about that is that that's actually where I started to go when I went into the key UX elements. So when I started to go through, I started with the cookbook of like, okay, here is specifically for a membership, the four, um, what Russell calls the special elements for a membership. And so then I started to talk about, and I was going to go through the UX flows of just like general rules of thumb from a, from a UX perspective of how to think about these things. And I have to share a win with you, Dan. So the summit that I just built, I used your latest version of login, right? We had 350 people register. And so far, I think 40 have come in zero login tickets so far, zero. I've never had a summit, never built a membership site where no login issues have happened. And I know that there's no login issues because I watched the members come in and they're making progress in the membership area. And this was, is this what we built without the, um, without the password? No, I, cause I don't know how to build that yet. This was what the very I'm last even, version. I'm not before. even sure where that is anymore. <laughs> I know. Um, whenever you find it, I'm, I'm interested because I want to build it yeah. on one of my current membership builds. But um, the uh, but yeah, this is the first time ever that I've built a membership. And let me just check. This my was, be, was it because you put in the error handling? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the uh, so far, yeah, I'm checking my Zendesk one more time. Zero, zero tickets so far. First time ever for me. And again, yeah. it's not a huge sample size, but it's just one example of that investment and the key thing, the key UX stuff that has to go into login that are beyond what ClickFunnels out of the box is. And so I was going to dive into that and then search. This one is probably the most problematic that we don't have a good answer for yet, right? So search is, I, I take search out of every single one of my membership builds because it's worthless. <laughs> like it, yeah, I never put it in. It's worthless. Yeah. But just talking about like our, you know, how we have been tried searchy or just something because where this really comes in is the most critical UX element in a library model is search. And right now we don't have a good search option. No, so searchy, you, no, searchy would work great for a library model or anything that was not drip. Oh, okay. Drip anything where you give them all the content at once, searchy would work great. Okay. It's just when you do drip, the problem is, is so if you got something on an eight week drip, it'll be in the search results for searchy. Got it. That's the problem with it. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So that's perfect. Cause the library model, the most critical UX element is the search. And then I would say that the there's, you know, secondary options when you don't have a strong search um, in terms of like filtering and sorting and things like that, that you can use, but yeah. So, and then I was going to talk about, you know, generic UX principles of good navigation structures um, and then generic UX principles around uh, like content areas. Um, usually when it comes to content areas, the thing that it, it's the information architecture. And so I was just going to talk about basic principles of information architecture. Okay. So all those is coming in the training after we did the intro and the six models, and then this is all coming afterwards. I was kind of thinking that it would just be a... Uh, because it's not necessarily tied, right? But if somebody, it's like a foundation knowledge of like the four basic elements in a membership area and great UX um, 
principles associated with those four elements. And so okay. it can kind so, of almost be like a parallel, you know? Um, bonus. Yeah. Yeah. A bonus. Yeah. Week eight bonus. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, and actually, and you the, don't have a name video, for something, just call it a bonus. And, okay, well, in the video that you have of our session from before, um, I know that we need to make that more accessible from a learning standpoint. But a lot of the stuff that I talk about there is basically this is is these. I just didn't the, connect the thing the we didn't elements. the thing we did in Catherine's group. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's like the basic principles of Gestalt, basically. Although of I wouldn't what? use that term. Uh, sorry, of what I. Uh, gestalt principles it's the way that our little our, little, little words little words. uh it's the way that our uh oh, and when you start system, talking about cohort make sure you explain what cohort is yes, ahead of time i will okay. it's, the, it's the way that our visual perception talks to our brain and we know their principles of visual perception like when i see something we know there are principles of the way i can present something that the brain will understand that's essentially gestalt is when you when you see something flying at your head you duck exactly yes right. <laughs> that's that's not gestalt that's just flight or flight but yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's your primordial brain i'm talking about yeah. your evolved brain <laughs> oh okay yeah all right what else you got so okay and then um again so i'll go down into that and then the last thing i had was just and maybe you know rick and joanne i'd be interested if you guys but you know if people want like ux reviews we can offer that um and then that agency setup was you guys already saw that presentation of the the membership model you know like this is what Stu says from a uh just a if you, this rings a bell this membership side what, what's, a, what's the difference between a membership site and a what oh um so this is uh so this is here where we go through let me just go there okay so this is the you know you want to build a membership site and so then this went into what does that actually include? Do you remember this presentation? I do, yes. Okay. Yeah. So that's where, and then we talk about the difference between a membership site versus a membership. So right. for those Stu McLaren folks out there. Well, yeah, membership in, in his world could be, you get a box of fruit every month. It's this, yeah. It's by his his is basically it's a re reoccurring subscription model where one person opts or buys a reoccurring product or service yeah. it really has nothing to do with the the actual physical or the actual virtual space that people engage with yeah and again it was the same thing is basically we're back to the info model where that's like one of his seven right yeah yeah and i have his seven models that i can map into the 60 that I studied in the six models, but yeah. So that's this presentation, which I already gave, um, which I'll, I'll record um, and it could be a bonus. So that's that. And then um, the five bells and whistles. So this was the, um, this, I have this, this is the like things like um, elf sites. So that video on demand, you actually commented it on my Facebook live. So like one of the bells and whistles is how do you create a video on demand platform the, yeah. the from the basic to the advanced. Um, yeah. Another bell and whistle would be like an embed embedding type forms or Google forms. You already have a lot of vid videos on that, but I was going to talk about the actual use cases of how I've used it in experience. Well, yeah, that's that's the biggest thing here is is more of uh, just showing people examples of what's been done. Mm -hmm. Because until people see it or really get involved, um, they, they don't know what can be done. Right. Right. I mean, I didn't know that I could build a challenge like that until I decided I needed to build a challenge like that. And I only did that because what's his bucket? I don't remember his name. Got a hold of me and said, can you build this for me? Right. And I was just like, maybe. <laughs> of course, you can build anything. <laughs> no, you know. I gotta be honest. I don't think I've been stumped yet. Yeah, not it's good. awesome. <laughs> and it's awesome. Yeah. Um, another bell and whistle is another elf sites one, and that's for like a, if you need any kind of uh, for the reference library, if you need any kind of like social media feed, um, or a medium embed is another one bell and whistle. Again, that's more for the reference library model. Um, that's really good. You know, just thinking of something. Because, you, you know, you got the search element in ClickFunnels. Yeah. And I've never really paid any attention to it because I never thought it really worked. Uh, 
if you put a bunch of text under a video, does it find that text or does it only find the lesson titles? Are you talking about like the out of the box element in ClickFunnels? Yeah. It's just the lesson titles. It is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's very, very limited then. Yeah. Um, well, I'm just thinking, cause otherwise you could like transcribe a video and dump all the text underneath the video and then it would find it on the search. But so then the question becomes is, is there a plugin like an L sites or something like that, where you could put that in there, but then again, you'd still have to take all the text out of the video and put it below. So or, like back in the day, we used to have like Google used to give a open API to insert a Google search element into a website. I don't know what happened to that or where that went, but if that was an option. That'd be amazing. Yeah. Well, Steve Jobs told him to get rid of everything except one thing. <laughs> were you, were you around, were, were you around in the days when you had like the Google wonder wheel and yeah. all the other tools that they had? I remember you that. Notice like all on one day, they all went away. Yeah. Because Steve Jobs talked to Sergey and Larry and said, what the hell are you guys doing? Yeah. You do one you know, thing. Focus on one damn thing, not these 200 different things you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So we can thank Steve for ruining Wonder Wheel. Oh, Steve. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. So anyway, so yes. Yeah, so game plan then is I will start to record on the sixth uh, or on the six videos. Well, the one overview and then the six for the six models. And then all the bonus ones I'll record as a bonus, but I'll, I'll first deliver these six models. Well, yeah, because once you deliver them, then I, we got to figure out what additional stuff I need to put in and where we need to put them and all that stuff. Okay. Because I may not start dripping this out until maybe second or third week, fourth week anyway, who knows? Yeah. But we'll talk about that. Uh, so are you done with your thing here? Cause I will turn off the recording. Yeah. 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 I mean, okay. I think so go on forever, but I'll stop here and. <laughs>